on a special report of World News Tonight. We take you to Milwaukee in the United States, where the race for the White House now gets the nod of one of the major political parties. Donald Trump has now been officially anointed as the Republican Party's nomination for the 2024 presidential race. And on behalf of the 125 delegates in the unbelievable state of Florida, we hereby nominate every single one of them for the greatest president that's ever lived, and that's Donald J. Trump. Hereby declaring him the Republican nominee for president of the United States of America. Breaking tradition, Donald Trump, after surviving a horrific attempt on his life, appears on the first day of the convention, visibly in a reflective mood. But his supporters erupt in cheers to see their leader surviving. Tonight, we focus on how another Trump presidency would impact the world and how the investigation of the attempt to assassinate the former president seems to be moving. All that and more as a special report of World News Tonight starts right now. This is a World News Tonight special report. The Republican National Convention and the attempt on the life of former President Donald Trump. Reporting tonight from Studio 24, here's Mahish Jani. Good evening everyone, thank you very much for joining us on this Tuesday night as the global news attention is all on in on the Republican National Convention and also what's happening with the investigation regarding the attempted assassination of former President of the United States, Donald J. Trump. Now, I will be here for the next uh, hour or so to provide a 360-degree coverage as a will wait and see how America will shape itself after this tragedy. Now, we will we see another Trump presidency? Or next month, how will the Democrats take on this challenge? Will they go behind uh, Joe Biden and support him? Or will there be another candidate facing Trump? Lots of stories, uh, so let's get right to it and we begin our coverage tonight with the latest on the Trump assassination attempt. Now, the uh, 2024 election campaign has a new iconic image. Donald Trump, moments after narrowly avoiding serious injury or death from an assassin's bullet, standing with his fist raised, lines of blood straight across his face and an American flag blowing in the breeze behind him. You have all seen this image. This is indeed iconic. Now, the FBI is trying to determine why Thomas Crooks, uh, Crooks decided to open fire at a Trump rally in Pennsylvania on Saturday. Officials say that local police saw him on the rooftop but couldn't stop him before the shooting. They say Crook's father called police after the shooting, saying that his son and an AR-style rifle were missing from their home. Meanwhile, new details uh, from the FBI say that they are analyzing the phone of Thomas Crook and have gained access to his phone. Grainy video shows the shooter, Thomas Crooks, moments before he fired an AR-15 style rifle at Donald Trump. Someone's on top of the roof, look. He does not go unnoticed. He's on the roof! According to two senior officials, local police officers saw Crooks on the rooftop, but couldn't stop him before he opened fire injuring former President Trump. 50-year-old Corey Comparator, shielding his family from the gunfire, was killed. David Dutch and James Coppenhaver were critically wounded before a sniper team shot and killed Crooks. Among the many unanswered questions tonight, how did the 20-year-old get on that rooftop and why wasn't it better secured? He had a vantage point just 148 yards from the podium where Trump was speaking. Snipers took up positions nearby, but the Secret Service says the rooftop was outside of their security perimeter. Crook's father, who according to the FBI has been cooperating with the investigation, legally purchased the rifle his son used. Crooks purchased ammunition at this store near his home just hours before the rally. Senior officials say more than a dozen firearms were found while searching the family's home. After the shooting, they say his father called police, worried his son and an AR-style rifle were missing. 
Crooks graduated from community college and worked as a dietary aide at a nursing home. He was also a member of a shooting club at a firing range. He was just a normal kid to me, walking around the neighborhood. I mean, he was just a bit odd, that's all. But authorities still have not identified a motive, even after analyzing Crooks' cell phone, according to a senior law enforcement official. While the small rural town of Butler struggles with what happened here. All right, uh, now lots of finger pointing towards the Secret Service of the United States. As many analysts say that there was a clear breach of security at the Trump rally and that it was not just one incident that went wrong, but a series of unfortunate events that led to the f finality of Thomas Crooks being able to fire the bullet. Other than a World News Special Correspondent, Susan Shanali is following that story for us tonight. And she is standing by in Toronto, Canada, joins me now with the latest on that story. Shanali? Yes, Mahesh, the Secret Service, which is responsible for protecting presidents and former presidents, has been under intense scrutiny since the shooting. U.S. President Joe Biden ordered an independent review of how the gunman could have come so close to killing or severely wounding Trump, despite the heavy security provided by the Secret Service. The Secret Service's coordinator for the Republican National Convention, which opened yesterday in Milwaukee, said the agency was confident in its security plans. However, the Secret Service said that the agency has implemented changes to Trump's security details to ensure his protection during the convention and the remainder of the campaign. Back to you, Mahesh. Susan Shanali, always good to see you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, that was other than our World News Special Correspondent, Susan Shanali, reporting from Toronto in Canada. Well, the first election convention of the upcoming U.S. presidential election got underway as the Republicans gathered in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is uh, definitely a battleground state, in the upcoming polls. Now, the Republican National Convention saw a breaking from traditions and its nominee, Donald J. Trump, took a seat and assured his party that he was fit to lead them back into the White House in November. As you would have expected, as soon as they saw Donald Trump on the screen, the entire convention hall erupted with cheers, tears and assurance that they all stand by behind their leader. A bandaged Trump, now the official Republican nominee for president, appeared alongside his uh, running mate, Ohio Senator Jenny Vance. The former president mouthed the words thank you and settled into a box with some of his children and U.S. senators uh, along with J Jenny Vance. Trump's choice for running mate announced earlier in the day. Now Trump is due to formally accept the party's nomination in the primetime speech on Thursday and will face Democratic President uh, Joe Biden in the November 5th election if Joe Biden is the candidate of the Democratic Party. The four-day convention began uh, less than 48 hours after the assassination attempt on the former president. Now, with an eye towards the future of a Republican Party dominated by former President Trump and his legions of MAGA supporters, Trump has named 39-year-old Senator J.D. Wentz of Ohio as his running mate on the GOP's 2024 national ticket. The former president who made his uh, greatly anticipated and high stakes announcement yesterday will now share the ticket with one of his top supporters in the Senate and a one-time Trump critic who has transformed into a leading America's first disciple. So who is Jerry Vance, who has a very good chance of becoming the next vice president of the United States with just a heartbeat to the most powerful job in the world? Donald Trump on Monday introduced his running mate in the 2024 election, U.S. Senator J.D. Vance. Trump first revealed the choice on his Truth social media website. The motion is adopted. At the start of the four-day Republican National Convention in Milwaukee to nominate the party's presidential ticket. Vance, who is 39 years old, is a former Trump critic turned staunch loyalist who enjoyed a rapid rise in American politics after winning a claim for his memoir, Hillbilly Elegy. Vance himself was harshly critical of Trump before and after Trump's 2016 election win against Democratic presidential nominee Hillary Clinton, calling him an idiot and America's Hitler, among other epithets. But as Vance geared up to run for the U.S. Senate seat in Ohio in 2022, 
he transformed into one of the former president's most consistent defenders. That about face appeared to win him Trump's endorsement. Thanks to the president for everything, for endorsing me. And I gotta say... And the Republican would go on to defend Trump's positions. He has downplayed the severity of the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol by a violent mob of Trump supporters trying to block lawmakers from certifying the results of the 2020 election. They, they asked me, they said, well, you know, wasn't January 6 the constitutional crisis? And I shook my head and I said, no, no, no. January the 6th, Donald Trump trying to challenge an election through constitutional means, that is the opposite of a constitutional crisis. On the campaign trail, the former venture capitalist has also served as a bridge between Trump associates and wealthy Silicon Valley donors, many of whom have opened their wallets to Trump this election. Still, Vance's selection has its detractors among Trump associates, notably those who wanted Trump to select a diverse vice presidential candidate. Though Trump and Biden are virtually tied in most national polls, Trump trails the Democratic president by significant margins among women and black Americans. Some Trump associates privately questioned whether it would be wise to take Vance out of the Senate with Democrats and Republicans vying for control of the upper chamber. Democrats hold a one-seat advantage, though they are likely to lose ground in the November election. Well, with all the events occurring right now, focusing a lot on Donald Trump. Now, Joe Biden, the U.S. Uh, president, the incumbent president, took to NBC to speak about his campaign and what he hopes to do in the next four years. Both men are vying for a second chance to lead the United States. U.S. President Joe Biden has said it was a mistake for him to say time to put Trump in a bullseye days before Saturday's assassination attempt on his election rival. Biden's remarks came in his first interview since the incident in which he defended his rhetoric against Donald Trump and cited why it was important. President Biden, in an interview with NBC, clarified his call to focus on Trump and his policies rather than tempering his own rhetoric. Despite criticism within his party, Biden confirmed he would continue continue his presidential campaign, emphasizing his mental acuity and listing his accomplishments. He addressed concerns about his age, acknowledging their legitimacy, but expressed confidence in the voters who supported him in the Democratic primary. Following the recent shooting at a Trump rally, Biden reiterated his call to lower political temperatures, denying that his rhetoric had incited violence. The FBI identified the gunman as Thomas Matthew Crooks, a registered Republican who was killed by a Secret Service sniper after targeting Trump. Let's take a short break. Now, on the other side, we will discuss how these events unfolding in America will impact the rest of the world. My guest uh, is attorney at law, Dr. Udara Sosa, who is also an analyst at the Jimmy Carter Institution in the United States. He'll be here um, after this break. Um, this is our special report of World News Tonight. We'll be back. Welcome back, everyone, to our special report on World News Tonight. Uh, we're talking about what's happening in America with regard to the uh, Republican National Convention, which got underway uh, yesterday. And, of course, next month, I think the Democratic National Convention will come into play. And, of course, there, that is going to be very interesting as well, because will Biden get the nominee? Everybody wants Biden to get out of the race. Uh, his age is uh, playing up. Um, there's not much of a difference between Donald Trump and uh, Joe Biden. Uh, Donald Trump uh, um, is just three years younger to uh, Joe Biden, but apparently everybody keeps saying that Joe Biden seems like he's 30 years older than Donald Trump. Well, uh, we had to wait and see. That'll, that'll play up uh, next month, and we will definitely bring that convention to you as well. Now let's break down the events from uh, last Saturday up until now and throughout how will American politics shape up because of the events that occurred? Uh, back with me tonight is uh, attorney at law, Dr. Uddara Soisa. Uh, he is the lecturer in charge of the public, for public international law at the Bandaranaike College of uh, International Studies. Welcome back. Uh, good to see you once again. It's interesting, isn't it? Last time when we were talking about, we were talking about a debate. And up until, this is like a soap opera. It keeps changing all the time. Um, this time around, Trump survives an assassination attempt. 
uh, goes to um, his convention as a hero. Uh, uh, not, not like uh, none of the, 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 um, the cloud of uh, being convicted, uh, being taken through the mud, none of that, that is valid anymore. His supporters, everyone is behind him. Uh, how do you, play, you know, analyze this entire thing? Mahesh, uh, great to be here, first of all. Um, I think, to add to what you said, this is um, better than a soap opera. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, from the significant age that the Trump, in, Trump, camp, Trump campaign had from the uh, debate, from this uh, luckiest, narrowest yes. escape that you'll ever see in any political uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. situation. Um, I think, yes, I mean, now the fact that he was a convicted felon to the fact that he incited a riot, January 6th, none, none of this is now at the center stage. Nobody even talks about it. In fact, I don't know whether you know, uh, 24 hours uh, ago, he was um, totally released from yes. all the charges from the Mar-a-Lago um, documents, classified document case. So you see that Trump's position slowly but surely uh, being consolidated from the point of extreme weakness, being a convicted felon and being accused of rape. In fact, he was almost uh, uh, liable for mm. rape as well as um, uh, defamation. Uh, you know, so ultimately from a, on a civil trial. So you can see from uh, that position to this position, it's, it's a significant and a tremendous boost for his campaign. Uh, let's talk about the events that happened on Saturday. Now, um, the FBI continuously say that, uh, uh, I know you, you are looking into criminal uh, cases as well, and you understand the entire uh, uh, you know, sequence of events. And if you actually look at what's happening in America right now with regard to uh, the failure of security uh, is actually been heightened despite the fact that the FBI comes back and say, no, no, we did everything possible. But there is a lot of questions that need answers. How did this gunman get into this heightened position when the entire area was, you know, heavily fortified with security officials? What is the entire failure? From which point did it start? Was Trump treated as a second-hand candidate? Hasn't the the Homeland Security has provided certain uh, uh, required uh, personnel to make sure that his security is being taken care of. Because uh, one thing that I saw in the morning in American media is they were now talking about how everybody should come together. But if you look at the media per se, they were so polarizing. They were painting him as a Hitler. He was, he, he's basically a threat to democracy. These are the words that was used. Uh, a 20 year old gets inspired by this. How do you see this, this gunman scenario? Do you think he was just a lone gunman or was there, uh, is there a story behind this? Now, Amahesh, in US, the, the, the entire protection details or entire protection uh, mechanism to a president or a presidential candidate is in the hands of Secret Service. So one of the key tasks of Secret Service was to provide security to whoever the candidate, whether it's from the left or to the right, whether it's a convicted felon. Uh, there was a discussion once um, I saw on New York Times where they said if Trump was uh, sent to jail, hmm. Secret Service people will <laughs> also be in jail now because now you have to protect him, right? Yeah. But um, so this indeed is a clear failure of Secret Service. For, for a convicted, I mean, for a uh, for a president, despite whatever his convicted status, he's a former uh, president. Yes, former president uh, to be um, exposed to this kind of a sniper vulnerability, a former president. You know, this is a insane breach of security. Does that uh, mean, in, in your opinion, that? America is slowly in the decline in terms of like, you know, if you look at security per se, security, uh, the body of a president is like the utmost thing that the security services personnel can do, whether it's the military, whether it's uh, the Navy SEALs, anybody, if the president is like uh, any, any, any aircraft the president gets into becomes Air Force One. Uh, and and you, you've seen this entire, uh, uh, you know, scenarios. Do you think they thought that there was no threat to Trump or because there is a lot of conspiracy theory on online, they seem to think like, did they really want this to be played out and they had any kind of advanced knowledge of the situation? In my opinion, um, I think it's highly unlikely. 
But what is interesting is to understand the, the current uh, rhetoric, the current yeah. uh, the tension that is in the system where often Trump is portrayed as Hitler to yeah. you know worse criminals. So you you know killing Hitler is a heroic act. So yeah, yeah, exactly. this kind of rhetoric by various politicians, I'm sure to some point uh, inspired whoever wanted to shoot. Because if you constantly uh, paint a, polit a political negative picture of a president or former president, ultimately this person will be a um, target. And indeed, Secret Service has done some work in, in, in the past addressing whatever the threats that has uh, been on both Biden, Trump, Clintons, uh, whoever was in the candidacy in the past. But I think ultimately this hopefully a lone gunman was able to get a shot at the president, no. which is uh, almost unprecedented for, for the last several decades that's ever since the, uh, Kennedy. That's, that's the biggest question that I have. This guy is never uh, trained as a, a, a military personnel. He's he's not a sniper. He's not a sniper shooter. He doesn't have a, a, a strong military background in order to carry out such a, a meticulous uh, act. If you, I don't know whether you saw the videos where he's slowly creeping in on, on, on the roof, uh, knowing the fact that security is watching him. There are snipers. He, he kind of had that knowledge. He wore beige suit to make sure that he blends with the roof. All this is very uh, uh, disturbing to a certain extent if a 20 year old without no military background, no military uh, training whatsoever is inspired to the point where he can actually, he thinks he can carry out such a, and he did. Almost did. Yeah, he almost <laughs> did. Uh, how do you see this? Because. Uh, it is worrying as we move on with this polarizing political rhetoric. I think it's um, shocking. Yeah. <laughs> the fact that he was able to get up there to aim and to shoot uh, without uh, being properly intercept intercepted by the secret services. And and you know, in uh, this kind of a um, environment, you have several layers of security. You have the yeah. state police providing protection. You have the county. You have that area, the, the, the local police, which is the county police, together with FBI X and with total uh, duty of the Secret Service. So yeah. you have these layers and layers and layers and layers of security providing um, for this uh, very likely to be <laughs> winnable candidate. Yeah. And this um, a, you know, a youngster, 20 years, you know, uh, just after probably, you know, high school, now able to do this kind of a uh, almost a daring attempt and to kill the the former president, I mean, that's, uh, in my opinion, it's it really weakens the the core basis of uh, the strength that the U.S. possesses to uh, have in the in, in the international arena. They are, exactly. If they are not able to, if the United States is not able to protect its most highly winnable yeah. candidate, what assurance do you think the U.S., CIA, FBI, Secret Service, can give to anywhere in the world this American position now is effectively un undermined by it is not I mean like the, the threat didn't come from let's say Al Qaeda oh, or ISIS, ISIS so or any of those uh, 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 terrorist organizations it actually came within the United States and it is also not a, a, a individual who is very basically like you know um, he is like martyr to a certain extent where he has a philosophy no, I mean the FBI says there is no evidence to show that he's actually following anyone uh, for that matter so uh, do you think that he was pushed to a certain extent or how do you how do you think? I think the current rhetoric that is going on in US where you paint uh, former President Trump as the Hitler and obviously you can see from the debate I'm sure yeah. this debate also contributed because yeah. this debate highly showed to the world who will be the next president it's not Biden it's Trump so somebody had to do something about it because this Hitler is coming up Biden is not able to stop it you now have to take action. This type of polarization, mm -hmm. this type of insane um, logic that is being spread in in the present US political climate, I'm sure motivates normal people like you and I uh, to take up arms. I mean, this is very, very destructive. Uh, how do you see this playing out for the rest of the world? Because America's position, uh, I mean, if Trump is successful in securing the presidency again and he become, becomes the president, 
how do you think events around the world would re-impact? Because he's no longer the, the, the new kid on the block. He's a seasoned politician. He has been the president for one term. The world saw how he rules and governs. How do you see that? I, I see that Trump's second term, which is more of a reality now, unless something ra ridiculously radical will take place, will, will be significantly different from what is happening right now. I think, in my opinion, Ukraine war will come to an end, in my opinion. I think the US, um, the extreme liberal work yeah. lobbies influence around the world and various fundings of certain NGOs, etc., who's propagating this type of um, ideology will be a bit reduced. So in a way, I don't see it's overall bad, to be honest. I think the fact that this neoliberal concepts of mm -hmm. almost neocolonizing the world yeah. through these uh, various mechanisms, I don't think it's healthy. Even to US, they're spending trillions if not millions, yeah. on, uh, on various is, conflicts that, around the world. That will be paid back by the American people. Um, that entire billions and trillions that is going out from America to places like Ukraine. Ukraine yeah. um, all those uh, uh, things that, that is currently happening will be bill, uh, basically paid out by the pockets of Americans. Indeed, and look at the inflation. Um, you may see better numbers on the paper, but yeah. you know, um, while I was in US, uh, you know, a decade back, we were able to get gas for $1.99. Now look at the gas prices, you know, 10 years later. So in my opinion, I think the American public is done with the current political environment. Uh, unfortunately, the Democratic Party is not able to uh, change yeah. with the times, and I think this uh, this is a wake up call. Uh, let's talk about the Republican National Convention, which basically, uh, I don't know whether you watched it, but uh, it gave the impression that uh, uh, Donald Trump, when he came back, people loved him so much. What they wanted to tell you what uh, was the fact that he's no longer that guy who who is bad. This guy f is fighting for us. This guy is the one that we got to follow. So there is no two-tone uh, uh, rhetoric that is coming from the Republican National Convention anymore. It was like one single message, and that was fight, fight, fight. Uh, how do you see this entire entrance of uh, Donald Trump? back into the RNC as a hero. If you, you, we must see this from 2020 angle, where almost half of the, the Republican Party, or actually more than half, yeah. just gave up on him from after January 6th. The fact that from that point, he was able to come to this point despite being heavily prosecuted from fed, at federal level, state level, and also at a civil level now to be a hero. And also, I think he's a, He's quite lucky he in, is, in many senses. Yeah, and he is fighting one of the weakest. surviving that assassination attempt, uh, I, I don't know, there is no other way to say it, but he is lucky. He's fighting against one of the most weakest presidents that you saw in terms of charisma and personality. I think it's, uh, I, think the Demo I think the Republicans do not have any, any, any choice. Uh, I have heard some uh, senators arguing that this, is, this man has been anointed by God himself. That God protected him. this kind but of rhetoric. That was the message at uh, the RNC. And that's exactly what people were saying. God has intervened. Uh, so Unbelievable. Th there is a lot of evangelical uh, base for Probably, the Republicans. Yeah. And I think this kind of reinvigorated them and brought them back into the foray. And they actually now think there is a divine in intervention and Trump is anointed per se. In my opinion, though this might be short term um, helpful for Trump campaign, this type of uh, ideology in long term will be very unhealthy because you if you see us there is a clear separation between church and state yeah. now you see with a lot of rhetoric that is coming from the republican party is to combine and uh, in long term i think uh, in my opinion trump will do more harm if he is ever to do harm to the us the us internal uh, system whether it's good or bad, than but, to the rest of the world. Uh, that, that's what I uh, wanted to ask you, because he he's a candidate who, who we saw in the first term. He never wants to play by the rules. Yes. Uh, he wants to break the box. He wants to break the frame, come out. And a and lot of people see that as a really good thing, because then America can remold itself to whatever the current situation it is. Do you see it that way? Because 
The same argument on the other side is the extreme woke. Because the extreme woke is also on the guise of we broke on every barrier, we broke, bro you, they break everything, and now they end up in these uh, unthinkable uh, situations. Unimaginable situations. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and 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 uh, 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 you know the beliefs they have in terms of those kinds of woke ideology is also bad. So how do you see this? So I think American public can relate. Oh, my, um, a significant number of American public can relate a little bit more to the, uh, the evangelical or the extreme right religious sections than to the to the woke crowd. And I think the fact that the woke crowd has, in my opinion, they have gone a bit out of control to a point that normal people who are in the center, not in the left or to the right, feels threatened. Right. So I think this. I think we saw that uh, on the July fourth. Uh, uh, celebration, their independent celebration, where California said uh, no fireworks. Uh, they banned fireworks in California, and the response from the normal public was they went to a town with fireworks and they basically, you know, threw everything out there. And but not only that, I mean, if you look at the whole gender, I mean, they are inventing like 20, 30 odd genders. I mean, things that are totally like out of some, somebody comes up with this idea and then everybody takes it to like out of proportional context and now it's enforced upon a great number of people who do not want to swallow this bill, right? So I think in my opinion, more the radical left and the work crowd pushers, you will get a similar result from the, the right and this will go back and forth. Does that mean that the Democratic Party has to reinvent themselves? In my opinion, yes, I think the Democratic Party has to come a little bit more to the center, center, in my opinion, because more they go to the left, more they they alienate the public that is at the center. I think majority of the people anywhere in the world is at the center, not at the left or not the right. So when you when you try to push that the proportionately higher number of population into into that, and you're not going to uh, get a good result. And Trump probably saw that with this abortion policies, right? So when you try to ban abortion, etc., you saw Trump lost that center, but now with everything that is going on, you can see that uh, the left is losing this battle critically. Uh, in, in terms of his uh, um, vice presidential pick, Jerry Vance, uh, a senator from Ohio, Ohio is a battleground state, but a lot of people say that he can actually talk to the middle Americans and also speak to more of the left because he makes sense. He can go to media, can have an argument with anybody uh, with regard to Trump. And he's a strong follower of Trump and the uh, Make America Great Again uh, MAGA, entire, yeah. uh, MAGA, uh, MAGA um, what do you, uh, fellowship. So how do you see his pick? Do you think that was a correct one? I think in at this point, I think even if he pick you and me, I'm sure <laughs> he'll have a, a wonderful chance to win. I, I mean, I, I think it's he, yeah. if he to win or lose, that will be on himself alone. But obviously, to cement cement this, I think somebody at Marga, but who is able to appeal to a section at the obviously not the left, but yeah. at the center and the center right, I think would add a bit more, especially in states. There are a lot of you know battleground states, etc. To maybe to uh, increase his margin of victory, and you know what, having a greater margin of victory means having greater political weight throughout his exactly. term. Uh, uh, Joe Biden, you think uh, will he be the person who will go against Trump, or do you think Kamala Harris or someone else might take the position? In my opinion, I think at this point. I don't know if anybody wants to put their <laughs> neck down at this yes. garrison. And uh, in my opinion, this decision maybe should have been done a long, long time back. And at this point, uh, running against a ca candidate who's strong as Trump, I don't know if anybody, even you know, people like Newsom, I, do, I don't know whether anybody would jump in. Might be better for the Democratic Party to for let uh, Biden run and get a recover defeat back in, and uh, recover yeah. back in four years and maybe try to balance the Senate and the, the House of Representatives, you know, to get the Congress. Very quickly, uh, we are running out of time. Um, in terms of, for the world, in your opinion, what is worse, a Biden presidency, uh, a second term of Biden or a second term of Trump? 
depends on in what context. I, I, I believe in Ukraine context, etc. I think having this type of conflict being dragged on for another three, four years with potential of a nuclear war, I think in that sense, to have a, to get a person who doesn't want to continue with this type of uh, conflict might be best for the world. And you know, if a nuclear bomb goes in uh, Ukraine, you know, yeah. none of us will be safe. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, Dr. Udara, uh, Soisa, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, that was uh, Dr. Udara uh, Soisa, uh, the lecturer in charge uh, for public international uh, law at the Bandaranaika College of International Studies. Well, we're going to take a short break. Uh, more world news. Our special report on world news tonight will continue right after this. Stick around. Well, let's get you uh, with regard to other stories that is making headlines all around the world. Let's take you to France first. France is preparing for another week of political maneuvering as the newly elected National Assembly met for the first time today. With the leftist new popular front alliance still divided over a candidate uh, for prime minister, the fight for the powerful speaker's role in parliament seems likely to dominate in the coming days. Will this coming week bring political clarity to France's horizon following the chaos of the snap legislative elections? All eyes are on several key dates to come. Before the 17th of July, President Macron must, in principle, accept the government's resignation presented by Prime Minister Gabriel Attal last Monday. The government will then remain in place temporarily. An outgoing government is reduced to functions which are vital for the country. This means continuing policies which are already underway without implicating the future government. The other urgent element is maintaining public order, for example, during the Olympic Games. But will the outgoing ministers go back to their seats in Parliament? Though there's no rule within the Constitution, this is what has happened in the past. These 17 ministers and MPs intend to participate in the 18th of July vote to elect the President of the Assembly. There remains much uncertainty around the succession of Yael Brown Pivet, for which she herself is a candidate. Meanwhile, still no consensus on a candidate for Prime Minister among the new Popular Front, the left-wing alliance that won the most votes in last Sunday's election. There was brief hope around the president of overseas territory, La Réunion. Huguette Bello was supported by France Ambaud, along with some Greens and Communists, but not the Socialists, prompting her to drop out. Then this Monday, France Ambaud announced it was withdrawing from negotiations until a National Assembly president had been voted in. Meanwhile, less than a fortnight ahead of the Olympic Games, the Senate president says the French people have their minds elsewhere. The nomination of a new government now looks set to be delayed until the end of August. To the UK now, former NATO leader George Robertson will lead a review of Britain's military strategy to counter what he calls the deadly quartet, which is uh, China, Iran, Russia and North Korea. Follow that story for us tonight is other than a world news special correspondent Aruni Adhikari is standing by in Nottingham in the UK. Aruni? Yes, Mahesh. Lord Robuston, alongside new Defence Secretary John Haley, highlighted a deadly quartet of nations which are China, Russia, Iran and North Korea as the main security threat to the UK and NATO. This marks a shift from waving China as a systemic challenge to a more direct threat, reflecting sentiments from the recent NATO summit. The summit criticized China for aiding Russia in the Ukraine invasion, with Iran and North Korea also supporting Russia militarily. Robertson emphasized the importance of addressing threats in both the Asia-Pacific and Euro-Atlantic regions. President Joe Biden noted the increasing cooperation among the four nations and warned China of consequences for its support of Russia. Back to you, Mahesh. All right, well, that was other than a World News Special Correspondent Aruni Adhikari reporting from the UK. Thank you very much. To Kenya now, police in Kenya fired tear gas today to disperse hundreds of protesters aiming to keep pressure on President William Ruto 
after he made a series of concessions to demonstrators' demands. Leading activists uh, behind weeks of uh, protest, initially sparked by proposed tax hikes, called for a total shutdown of the country today. The protests have uh, created the biggest crisis of Ruto's two years in power and have continued all by with a smaller turnout, even after the president withdrew a $2.7 billion in tax hikes and fired nearly his entire cabinet. Many demonstrators are demanding that Ruto step down, blaming him for misgovernance, corruption and the deaths of dozens of protesters during early anti-government rallies. Today, police fired tear gas in Kitengala, a town on the southern outskirts of the capital, Nairobi, where around 200 protesters burned tires and chanted, Ruto must go and stop killing us. Well, with that, uh, we end uh, tonight's special report of World News. Thank you for joining us. Keep watching up there on 24 for the latest here at home and all over the world. I'm Mahesh Johnny. Appreciate your company. Good night.